So hello to all our listeners. Welcome to this episode of Now and Men. We're delighted that Professor Paul Highgate from Bath University is with us today, and we'll be talking to him about the concept of military masculinities. Now, I know he served in the Air Force for eight years before he became an academic. That's uh, some time in the past, I know, but he's very well placed, therefore, to talk from the perspective of someone who's been both an insider and is now an outsider. Um, Hi, Stephen. Hi, Sandy. Hi, everyone. Um, Yeah, so Paul is now a professor in conflict and security at Bath University. Uh, His research has focused on masculinity and military culture in a range of contexts, including uh, in relation to UK homelessness, UN peacekeeping, and private uh, military security companies in sub-Saharan Africa and Afghanistan. And in recent years, Paul has been looking at how militarism has become increasingly embedded in UK social life. Uh, So thanks so much for joining us today, Paul. Yeah, no problem. It's obviously a kind of critical time uh, internationally at the moment with the kind of buildup of military hardware and troops on the borders of Ukraine and the potential for yet another kind of devastating conflict to take place. Um, And so, yeah, as we said in the introduction, your research is primarily focused on military masculinities. Um, So could you tell us a little bit about what you understand by this term and why is it that you know why is it that military masculinities matter perhaps especially at a time of crisis like the current one that we're seeing in relation to Ukraine yeah well just a quick thanks uh, to both of you for inviting me on to this series I'm delighted to be here um so probably why I would start with this is to think about the broader international relations context um of um well I mean the current crisis in Ukraine but just thinking about how um you know gender and masculinity is embedded in international relations in a much broader sense and how something like you know the the the, the crisis in ukraine um it, it plays out in very particular gendered kinds of ways so we we could start with the idea obviously of vladimir putin as being somebody who projects a particular kind of masculinity on the world stage you might remember some of the uh, images of him riding you know topless on a horse you know projecting this kind of frontier you know machismo if you like um, and, and those kinds of ideas around what it is to be a man actually are embedded in war, conflict and international relations in a much broader context. Um, so I think what's interesting about Ukraine in particular is there's a lot of posturing there on the border, obviously, the buildup of troops. That There's a, almost like a subtext of kind of feminism of the European Union. It's not, a, you know, it's not sufficiently well uh, equipped to protect its borders, if you like. And so there is, you know, if you think think it through in terms of you know, gender, I think there's a, a robust, let's call it a kind of Russian masculinity poised to invade, you know, a feminized uh, state, which is not sufficiently, you know, strong to, to protect itself. So I think once you start thinking about international relations and any one crisis, you know, using the lens of gender can give you kind of quite a few interesting ideas. And finally, just, just really to say why is it important? It's important because masculine performances have material implications. And I think that's really the important point to mention here is that obviously, you know, these things are performative in, in that they're about symbolism, but they also do have, you know, a, a kind of a demonstrable impact on the ground, if you like. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and are there particular kind of values which uh, you see as being kind of often associated or celebrated within military masculinity? And and why is it and how is it that kind of political and military leaders like Vladimir Putin, for example, might draw upon some of these kind of idealized notions of masculinity uh, in these kinds of ways? Um, well, I think there's they're, they are normalized uh, on the world stage. Um, And I think to be seen to be less the masculine or feminine or to to conduct oneself in a softer kind of masculine way is often uh, to be seen to be weaker. So these hierarchies are fairly well established by now in in everyday life, but also in those kinds of contexts. And you'll think back to uh, Trump and the little rocket man and mine is bigger than yours. And I mean, the whole kind of, you know, uh, um, whole world of, you know, nuclear conflict in itself as Carol Cohen wrote you know some time ago is very much kind of infused with with very particular kinds of masculinity and it's about strength you know it's about mm-hmm. um and uh, being cool under pressure it's about reason um it, and and these kinds of attributes if you like are located within a hierarchy where you know you women are hysterical or, you know fem- femininities are shorthand for not being cool, being hysterical, being emotional, not being able to, you know, reason on the world stage in these kinds of very 
uh, difficult crisis situations. Presumably, I mean, it's about other qualities like, you know, aggression, individualism, a sort of rugged nature to that as well, mm. the use of force. Yeah. Um, you know, there are other qualities which are often associated with masculinity as well, aren't there in there? Yeah, very much so. Um, the, the, the writer who you may or may not be familiar with, Cynthia Enlow, who's a feminist international relations scholar, she has a definition of militarism, which has, uh, I think, seven key points. And if you look at each and every one of those points, it's very much about this. So it's very much about, you know, aggression is is how international relations are dealt with generally. A, a nation without a military is seen to be soft and less than a nation. But actually, once you start to interrogate all of these different criteria, you can see actually in the case of, for example, Costa Rica, who doesn't have a standing army, you know, I don't think there's a there's a kind of notion that it's a soft, weak, pathetic country that should be invaded. So I think there is something very performative, as I say, about these kinds of masculinities. They they are very symbolic. Um, and again, once you dig a bit deeper into them, you find they're much more complex than these more caricatured kind of presentations suggest. Hmm. We thought as a backdrop to this discussion, it'd be useful to say something also about the place of the UK military and UK life in general. I mean, it's very difficult, you know, for a political leader to to question the military, look at what happened mm. to Jeremy Corbyn, who was seen as unpa- unpatriotic. Mm. But the military are generally, as I understand it, highly popular, highly respected. You know, despite what can be seen as fairly disastrous outcomes mm. in Iraq and more recently in Afghanistan, the military are taken to embody in some way in, in quotes global Britain punching above its weight and so mm. on and so forth. I mean, is, is there any justification for this view that puts the military kind of on a on a pedestal? Or is it just some romantic nostalgia drawing on a misleading understanding of our colonial past? How do you see the place of the military? Mm. Well, I think you you draw out a couple of very important things there. So, yeah, very much embedded in empire. The military was at the spearhead of empire, obviously, the the Royal Navy in the early days. Um, It's a a canonised institution that, you know, embodies this uh, pristine, well-disciplined figure, you know, and obviously masculinity is all part of this picture, if you like. Um, you know, highly trustworthy, trustworthy, loyal citizens, almost like super citizens, as, as some have said in the US context of the, the US military there. So they are more than civilians. They're they are greater than civilians. And as you say, they're hugely respected. They're one of the few institutions that always features, you know, like 80 percent approval ratings, etc. And so I think, you know, that the, the, the issue we, we face here is work has to be done, if you like, by by the Ministry of Defence, but by the media, by a lot of institutions, by the elite to maintain this kind of hegemonic status of this institution in in British society. And you mentioned Iraq and Afghanistan, and actually what happened there was quite interesting because obviously we know how how badly those two conflicts went and how the military became associated with failure in both of those contexts, which in turn kick-started a whole kind of drive to militarise British society as one way to redress, you know, the public's kind of concerns around the body bags coming home, military not performing satisfactorily. But of course, all of this uh, based on the premise that the military was the solution to the problem, of course, and this is obviously right at the heart of the matter. Um, and and so what you saw in uh, around the end of the 2000s, so about 2007, 2008, was a document called the National Recognition of Armed Forces, which I think Gordon Brown was the prime minister at the time, which, you know, laid out a, a kind of a roadmap of how to increase the popularity of the military uh, in British society. And that's that's the point at which, you know, you can see a lot of what we see today, armed forces parades, um, veterans parades, you know, many more cadet kind of institutions in schools, troops to teachers, which some of these things have faded away. You know, the poppy is a much more important kind of symbol of patriotism. So there's been a there's been a significant shift it's argued from um, remembrance of the armed forces to celebration of the armed forces. And I think that's what's probably happened over the last 15 or so years. Right. I I think we'd like to come back to some of the issues that you raised there in that answer about, you know, the ways militarism um, appears within UK society. But another thing we wanted to talk to you about was the culture within the military. And I know in a, in a, very interesting recent lecture, which incidentally is available online and we'll put in the show notes. And that was called Beyond the Myth of the Apolitical Actor, the Case of the British Military. You quoted from some fairly shocking posts on the Armour Rumour Service, which I believe the, the shorthand for that is ARS, but anyway. Um, and it's the largest unofficial online military community. I was, I was amazed to discover it had 200,000 people contributing 
every month. But what the posts seem to show is that misogyny, homophobia, uh, far-right extremism, these are still rife in service service subcultures. Mm. So it, it seems also that there's a contradiction between the sort of official discourse which is, you know, these views are not a con- not condoned, they'll be dealt with, and the reality that they're actually just below the surface. Mm. How, do we, how do we deal with that? Well, that is a, 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 a billion-dollar question in a sense. So I think um, one of the ways to come at this is to think about how generally in an all-volunteer force, individuals who enlist are self-selecting. Uh, I mean, there's, there's some complications around that in terms of, you know, drawing on very poor regions of the UK, how much choice individuals have in terms of employment opportunities is obviously up for question. So, you know, it's not an open choice, but nevertheless, there is a there is a degree of self-selection there. And I think that people are drawn to our, the armed forces, um, and in particular the army, and I think we should also be fairly nuanced about how we think about the Air Force and the Navy and these kinds of questions. But the army does tend to attract a disproportionate number of individuals, perhaps with those kinds of views, it would seem. Now, in terms of what you do about that, I think the very essence of um, army service or military service um, as it stands, in a sense, it's, I'd say it attracts those people, but those kinds of values seem to be extremely tenacious. They haven't shifted over many years. It's a very traditional closed organization where external pressures often, they may provide a kind of set of changes at the higher level where people say, oh, you know, we're working on this and we're changing the culture and it's bad apples. And this is what you see in the the police, the Met Police in particular, in in more recent months. But what you tend to find is no matter how much you try to change it, given the self-selection and given the kind of persistence of individuals within the the organisation that want to hang on to those views, it's very difficult to change. What what has happened in a sense, and that's why ours is the the, the room is such an interesting resource, is I think it, it, it peels back the mask and here's what we actually have. Because, of mm. course, you know, people know not to say certain things and, you know, in public discourse, it's it's not acceptable to be racist, sexist, etc. But, of course, in the, in, in the military context, within these subcultures, those ideas thrive, they feed off one another. Um, and I think this brings us back to the question of masculinity, really, is, you know, it, it's very difficult, I think, to actually exclude yourself from these groups um, in terms of what it is to be a man in those contexts. So in other words, you know, it's not just membership of a particular social group or subculture, but it's also about who you are as a, as a masculine male in, in that kind of institutional context. So I think it's it's very difficult to break that. I'm not sure quite how you'd do that. I mean, I suppose you talk about, and as I've talked about, you know, demilitarization and shifting from, you know, all the resources that are part of the military into other institutions which, which are militarized and therefore less gendered in those kinds of ways. And and how do um, how do women fit into this? Like, what can you say something about kind of um, what women's experiences within the military uh, look like now? I mean, um, perhaps a key feature of some of the different quite masculinized, you know, male dominated institutions which you've mentioned there is that women can often be kind of marginalized or sexually harassed or abused. Um, and there was just a report which just came out recently, wasn't there? A parliamentary report which found that almost two thirds of women in the armed forces have experienced bullying, sexual harassment uh, or discrimination during their career. So, I mean, do you, yeah, do you think that uh, that is a key feature of these kinds of uh, masculinized institutions like the military still now that e- even though obviously we have some changes that that women are continuing to experience these kinds of things? Yeah, I think it's, uh, I mean, it is really interesting that things don't, I mean, since I've been doing my research 20 odd years, but things don't seem to have really changed in the way that we might hope. I mean, I, I, I'm, I shouldn't be, but I'm continually continually surprised by seeing more and more of these reports generated over the years you know drawn from serving members and and people who have served talking about the culture the gendered masculine culture and deeply homophobic culture and you'll remember that recently it was in the press um that the armed forces is going to recognize the the harm done to people who are kicked out for being gay uh up until 2000 which is just very recently really um and so i think what you tend to find is in this case, women have to be, they, they have to navigate this in, in really quite subtle and complex ways. So they, they're either one of the boys and they mm. kind of, you know, join in the more masculine kind of banter or uh, that they withdraw from that. And then they're kind of ostracized to a certain extent or over feminized or even designated as less than 
you know people that shouldn't be serving armed forces because they're not as not sufficiently masculine if you like so they 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 it's very difficult for them to to be able to find their particular you know to be seen on a level playing field and i think this is this does vary though and it's important to point out between the different services and different occupations mm. so i think if you were to go into you know an army uh, combat sort of um two thumbs uh, setting where you have women who now are allowed officially to so-called serve in the front line, you probably have a lot more of that than you'd find in an RAF admin office, for example. Um, so, mm. so I think it, I think there is a great deal of variation there, and that's mm. probably one of the reasons why when we talk about the military, you know, we are bringing together a lot of subcultures uh, mm. under one label, and you know, there has to be some sensitivity, I think, to the, the diversity there as well. Mm. Yeah, I mean, connected to that, I suppose in recent years, we've seen a supposed kind of feminization of the military with increasing numbers of women joining, uh, including in combat roles, as you said. And this is something which has been debated a lot, I suppose, in, in recent decades. Um, and do you think that that actually, you know, that that might have a positive impact on on male colleagues? Um, and is, is this kind of uh, in, more inclusionary approach to things like race, sexuality, gender, religion, in, in terms of like recent recruitment campaigns, for example, you know, do you think that that's a good thing? Uh, in the sense that you know the military is becoming more representative of the of wider society, or are there kind of risks or problems with this kind of trend in your eyes? Well, if I'm speaking personally, I I mean when I started started out in the world of academic research um, after my PhD, I, I was very much of a kind of more liberal persuasion that you know the the, the institution of the military should be fair, it should be open to women, it should be you know, these hierarchies between the genders shouldn't exist. But now I think actually you know, in a, on, on a more kind of radical feminist perspective might be, look, why do we want to support the armed forces? You know, why do we want to, you know, lend credibility and legitimacy to an organisation that is essentially tasked with use of violence, state-sanctioned violence? You know, maybe our politics should be elsewhere. Maybe we should be seeking to demilitarise. So I think there is a danger, I mean, from my perspective of, you know, making the organisation much more cuddly and, and a kind of much more, you know, representative of wider society because it could be argued that then your foreign policy uh, might be even more problematic around the use of the military because it's not seen as quite the terrible thing that it could could be, you know, in terms of its use of violence um, and, and its kind of racial, uh, racialized um, or racist cultures. So I, I think there are there are arguments out there around, you know, a more liberal feminist perspective, which is let's make the armed forces much more open to women versus, you know, a more radical view, which is, you know, why do we want to legitimize the organization through including, you know, more gay people or more black people or whatever it might be so so it's almost kind of sanitizing maybe it's about sanitizing its image as much as anything perhaps well i mean i think it i think you know going back to what we were saying earlier it's a very popular institution and very revered mm. and so you know in many contexts the idea that you know women can excel in this institution have a great deal of um you know that they're important i mean that it's a mark isn't it so it stands as a an important benchmark of how successful a woman might be if she can succeed in this masculine context and do well. And of course, that's how the armed forces likes to portray it. But I, I like I say, you know, if we think in a more radical sense, not even that radical, more you know, pacific sense, then what are we doing? You know, we spend our time legitimizing an organization that we should be arguing against, or at least thinking about how we might divert resources from it to other, you know, more peaceful uh, places, if you like. I mentioned in the introduction that you were in the Air Force for eight years at the start mm. of your career. So you've been on a bit of a journey your, yourself. And I think you've fairly amusingly described your time there as flying a desk. But <laughs> what what was your experience like and, and what impact did it have on you personally? Why, why did you join up in the first place as well? Yeah, so I mean, I think um, I said earlier on, you know, the idea of uh, people being or poor parts of the region being the key recruiting sites for the armed forces, because obviously, you know, choices are relatively limited work-wise. I think that was the case with me. So I was a pretty unsuccessful school student and I had a family who had a military background, all in the Air Force, actually. So I think very early on, the trajectory was always that I'd probably enlist into the armed forces, probably the Air Force. Um, you didn't actually have, you don't actually have to have any qualifications to get into the, the armed forces. I mean, if you come in at a low level, obviously, in fact, in the case of the army, infantry, infantiers don't need to have a reading age above the age of twelve. So you know you can you can be in a situation where you have a very wide recruiting pool of very young people. And don't forget, the UK obviously, um, unusually actually in a global sense, still has child soldiers. So we have people enlisting before the age of eighteen, uh, 
Um, but, you know, there's been an awful pushback against that for many years, but it doesn't seem to have made much difference to the, the recruiting. Um, but in terms of my own experience, it was a it was a kind of implicit expectation that I would join the armed forces, join the air force. Um, and I think what I, what I can say is when you are 16, which is when I went through the process of enlistment and joined at 17, I mean, you know, you're very much a, a boy. I mean, I wouldn't would describe myself as a young man, even at that level. Um, so you're extremely impressionable and the kind of, uh, carrot they hold out for you. And again, it's very subtle is, you know, you, you are going to go into an organization that will transition you from a boy into a man. I mean, that's very cliche, we know. Um, but I think it's a very powerful image for young men, young boys um, who, you know, who are going through various crises of masculinity and various crises of, you know, adolescence and being a teenager and wondering, you know, what it's all about uh, to be a man and all the expectation that's placed upon them. So the armed forces do offer a very, a very palatable and acceptable, as I said, in terms of, you know, the wider response to it in the, by the public place to go and explore and, and develop those kinds of identity um, dimensions, if you like. Now, of course, I put it in this language now, but I'll, this I probably wouldn't have that <laughs> that resource to, to actually articulate it like I am now. But that, looking back, that's probably that was probably a huge element of of why I ended up in that organisation is because you know there was a, a kind of um, question of masculinity really there. And presumably, it's also presented as providing opportunities for young people to gain life skills, training. A bit yeah. of adventure and so on and so forth. That that that's part of it too, isn't it? Yeah. So it's it's more than a job. I mean, you know, we know from the advertising we see, you know, everywhere. Um, it, it's it's a it's a complete way of life. Um, yeah, it's a vocation, yeah. you know. So and and that's in a sense one of the issues is that you are promised very much, and yet the delivery is not so good. And we do know that a lot of younger people, particularly young younger recruits, leave um, the armed forces as early as they possibly can because obviously recruiters are extremely keen to promote this image of the armed forces or you can go out sailing you can do this you can and i think with it within the context of afghanistan and iraq in particular for the first time since the falklands conflict in 1982 people were you know being in, got involved in hand-to-hand -hand fighting you know combat uh, direct combat which which they hadn't signed up for really i mean <laughs> which sounds crazy but you know um an army psychologist once said, if people are coming through the door because they want to fight, we don't want them. So there's this kind of very strange um, kind of tension, really, between what the armed forces does ultimately and what kinds of people you want to enlist in the armed forces. And I think, you know, within the context of the two conflicts I mentioned, that we've mentioned, um, that was a real shock. You know, people suddenly thought, you know, they were losing friends, PTSD, the whole kind of thing was was very much not what they expected, not what they signed up for, strangely enough. That issue there that you raised a minute ago about uh, recruitment at 16, enlistment at 17, I mean, I mean, this puts the UK in a very different position from, from other European countries. That's right, mm. isn't it? We we recruit much younger. And so yes. presumably that, that has implications too. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'll be totally honest. We start recruiting as soon as we can. So in other words, um, from the age, well, I mean, it, and it depends what you mean by recruiting. Direct recruiting, no, but the cultural context of British society, which is quite militarised, you know, air shows, um, demonstrations by the army in your local town, recruiting kind of when they, when they come and try to recruit uh, on a Saturday afternoon or whatever. They are very, very keen, and you'll see it, and there's quite a bit of research around this, to bring children into the tents, to get them to hold weapons, you know, paintballing, mm -hmm. you know, this kind of thing from the age of six, seven, eight years old. So the recruiting starts at a very, very young age. I don't think that happens in other European countries as far as I know um, and it's this so-called drip drip effect so eventually once you know these people get to 13 14 they might be in the cadets and of course that's the pipeline into the regular armed services so yeah it starts yeah. I, now if you talk to the army about this they will say oh no no we don't recruit children or we don't we don't try to appeal to young you know very young people but of course they do and you know it's it actually it's demonstrable. You you can't argue against it. So it's an active policy in a sense. Yeah, and I mean, if, if, if as well connecting to what you were saying earlier, I feel like um, you know, in terms of what are the kind of forms of masculinity that we as a society value most, you know, Raymond Connell's idea of hegemonic masculinity, 
what the kind of most idealized forms of masculinity. I feel like military masculinity is right up there, isn't it? So mm. that's got to be very alluring as well for, for young men, I suppose. Mm. But obviously, um, you, you didn't stay in the military. So I was just wondering if you could say a little bit about that, about what led you to then, you know, continue in your career now as an academic and perhaps looking more critically at, at the role of the military. Uh, I mean, for example, you did a PhD on, on uh, homelessness among ex-soldiers, for example. So, yeah, could you just say a little bit more about, about that? trajectory um as it were so in a sense i was fortunate to sign up to a job that was awful so you know i think if i'd been a pilot or something i probably wouldn't have had the same kind of feelings that i had um so as as a clerk as i say as you mentioned there flying a desk um administration i mean administration in most places is pretty boring i guess for most people most of the time and i think what happened there was i became fairly quickly became bored with the notion that i'd be sat at this desk for the next 20 30 years um, and as I, you know, move through the chain of command, I'd be sat at another desk just a bit further away, and I'd be signing the forms of the junior people, and they would be, you know, so th- th- it all seemed to be mapped out in a terribly, you know, stifling way. So I think I began to question the job, but then I, the occupation within, the, you know, the clerking, if you like, but then I began to question, you know, the, the with, with the help of friends actually, and I should say it wasn't a, a sole effort. I met people I probably been at school with and people I knew more widely from civilian life. And what happened was a few of us ended up um, posted to the same unit and a sort of small rebellion grew from that. So normally the armed forces is very good at at kind of limiting the amount of questioning that goes on. It's normally if you question things too much, you're on your own, you're ostracised quite a bit. But this was a unique situation where four or five of us were regularly like, why are we here? What's this about? Asking questions that we shouldn't be asking in a sense. So that that set in train, you know, the idea that really you you make a choice. I think you either decide to stay in armed forces for a whole career or you leave early on because, you know, if if you're leaving at 30, 35, whatever, with no qualifications or qualifications, you know, that are not easily transferable, then you're not going to succeed so much in civilian life. It's going to be quite tricky for you. the, the final point to note there is I decided that I wanted to, you know, go on to higher education. So I did uh, an A-level in sociology and an A-level in English at night school in, in the last year of my uh, service. And doing an A-level in sociology was a complete revelation. So suddenly I could, I, I had a, the conceptual tools, if you like, to make sense of what had been going on, how I'd ended up in this organisation, um, what the institution was really about, um and of course in turn that i should definitely leave it and do something else so i think you know it was really about getting myself educated in a more critical sense about what i was doing which which was the final kind of moment really at which i point at which i realized i had to leave and obviously go into um you know go, go into further education or higher education otherwise i'd be stuck in a pretty mundane job i guess that was my thinking mm. Well, that's interesting isn't it because doing an a-level in sociology is for me as well what opened up my yeah. world well, and mind and also, uh, we interviewed uh, Dr. Mike Ward from Swansea University. He said precisely yes. the same thing yeah. in yes. one of our mm. previous episodes. Right. So yeah. it's, it's yeah. quite a common experience, yeah. I think. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. It's, 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 I mean, I think what's interesting is, you know, you, you live in a world where uh, certain views are normalized. Um, your horizons, if you like, are very closed down. Uh, in terms of you know what, the the politics of the situation, if you like, and something like sociology opens that white you know right up because it's basically saying, you know, who says you know why are these people telling you this? What, what, what's this all about? You know, what, why are we here? I mean, it's more profound questions are being asked, which again, the armed forces are not encouraged for obvious reasons. Yeah, and I mentioned as well there your PhD about homelessness in the military. And obviously, there's this kind of contrast, isn't there, with uh, yeah, with the, the idea about masculinity in the military, which is projected about heroism and things like that. But obviously, in reality, lots of people, lots of men who come out of the military have all sorts of uh, problems. You know, we see disproportionate numbers of men in prison from the military or men who are homeless, for example, or engaging in domestic abuse, for example. Mm. Um, and, and obviously, lots of men are also very traumatized from what they've experienced if they have ended up in Afghanistan or Iraq, for example, as you've said. Um, so yeah, could you perhaps just say a little bit about that, about how how men or, or people more broadly who have been in the military, how they are then treated, you know, by society uh, mm. when they do kind of come out of it? Um, yeah, so I think may- maybe one place to start is with with my findings from the PhD. So I set out mm-hmm. on the PhD with with quite a, an anti-military sentiment, you know, which I built up over the years. And 
what my PhD really, in a sense, was trying to set, trying to demonstrate um, how damaging the army was, and the the damage it did was, you know, here's the result, you know, rough sleeping, um, which is, you know, obviously a profound kind of amount of damage that's been done. However, what I found, and it goes back to my earlier point, um, and it kind of it, it kind of uh, wrong footed me in a sense because what I found was actually pre military experience or pre army experience was also important. So we often think of the armed forces or the military as it starts with the military and then we can read back, you know, whatever happens, um, you know, we can explain it through military experience. But a lot of this starts much before. So, you know, many, many uh, young people coming, uh, leaving care to join the armed forces, coming from really difficult backgrounds, socioeconomic issues, et cetera, et cetera. So it's slightly complicated by this. But what I would say is, you know, the armed forces do often create an awful lot of social harm for their members um and you know training people to kill having people involved in violence as a kind of you know the, the kind of main part of their job for those in combat situations first of all there are no transferable jobs for those in civilian life but also you are pushing people beyond really um what is normal i mean it's an abnormal thing to be trained to kill somebody okay so it comes with a lot of costs and we know from PTSD and that kind of thing, even for people that have not been involved in frontline combat or haven't been around those kinds of situations, post-traumatic stress disorder is still quite common. And that is because of the situations they've been placed in within training, um, within cultures that can be extremely dehumanizing, as I've said. You know, you have to you have to get people to hate other people. You have to build up a whole sense of skills based on you know things that people find very difficult to do normally in, in, in sort of everyday life and that has a big impact on individuals so um that has to be contextualized i think more broadly with with what happened also before enlisting into the armed forces so and that really is the, often the missing part of the puzzle and when i did my work on homelessness people would say oh they've been in the army they're institutionalized that's why they're homeless but you know the question's bigger and more complex but it's obviously the army didn't help i mean <laughs> that's it <laughs> I mean, you mentioned their um, training young people to to kill. I mean, that really resonated with me because, I mean, I was in a cadet force when I was young. Um, you know, we were taken out to fire three hundred three rifles from Second World War. And, um, you know, and you get a huge sort of kick. I mean, I mean a physical kick from, mm. from uh, shooting these weapons. And um, I found it incredibly shocking, actually. You know, just mm. the notion that mm. we'd fired at these targets and that could actually be a person. So in my personal case, mm. it felt like that put me off any thoughts about yeah. military. I don't think I would have thought about it anyway, but but I could very much see, you know, how for other young men that was incredibly attractive. Mm. You know, mm. that whole cadet force thing, for want of a better term. Yeah. I was just watching actually um, a couple of days ago the film If, I don't know if you've seen it, Lindsay Anderson's film from the yeah. late 60s, which mm. is sort of counterculture rebellion film. It's actually about mm. uh, public schools, but there's a huge amount in there about the connections between milita the military and religion as well. All right. You know, um, church and state. And I mean, mm. I really uh, would advise mm. anyone listening to, to have a look at it if you can. It's a, it's a great film. But yeah, you, you mentioned earlier how these approaches are all sort of growing. So that alongside the, you know, the growth of cadet forces, the troops to teachers program, you know, armed forces training days, whatever. Mm. Do you want to say a bit more about what's been happening with all of these? So, so just, just, just to backtrack, so it was, I think the document, I'm pretty sure it's called The Recognition of Our Armed Forces. And in that document was laid out a number of policy initiatives and, and we, what they were really about was educating the public about what the armed forces do, because I think many of the more senior military people and, and senior politicians assumed or thought that, you know, through educating the public, they will come to understand the importance of the armed forces and therefore be much more supportive, you know, during the kind of crises of Afghanistan and Iraq, if you like. However, I think what's really interesting about that was if you... Um, if you educate people, in a, however that's done through, you know, greater profile of the armed forces in everyday life, which is in, in some what they're trying to do, you also make it more likely that the body bags returning uh, will have a greater political effect on the wider public. That wasn't really thought about. So it was it kind of went wrong for them in a sense, because 
yes, you want to know about the armed forces and you want to educate people about it, but people are then more attuned to these events, you know, through Wooden Bassett, the return, repatriation of dead soldiers, dead uh, armed forces personnel. So I think they really struggled with that one. They they kind of realised that, yeah, it, it comes with a big cost. People take an active interest. And you'll remember the newspapers full of the obituaries of, you know, the fallen, if you like. The armed forces were, then became, you know, much higher profile on, on one level, but much more problematic on another. If I asked you about, say, the troops to teachers... Yeah program you know you could talk about that because there are particular kinds of masculinity which are involved yes. in that I think as well and it might be interesting to explore that a bit well I mean that was an initiative I mean so basically the the, the roots of that initiative in the US and they had a big pro- they have and have had for a long time a big program there for those leaving the armed forces uh, to go into classroom you know but in the UK context I think it was under Michael Gove the education secretary at the time and and the belief of course is that you know you have these inner city schools with uh, boys who you know need strong discipline really and that's you know they're out of control the classroom can't be controlled they're running amok um what they need is the firm hand of the ex-soldier who knows a thing or two about you know keeping people in line so i think that that was that was the rationale of course it wasn't quite presented like that because that sounds a little bit too crude you know it's presented as or here are people with wide experience and you know they've again coming back to the idea of the, the british military as a revered institution they're coming from these kinds of contexts they're super citizens they're good people they you know, they, they will make extremely good teachers for those kinds of reasons. But of course, the masculinity question was right at the heart of the matter because um, it was always at some level about controlling the classroom and, and, and particularly, you know, boys who, who are kind of out of control. And Because in a way, you could argue that's the antithesis of what education is about, you know, which is about learning to criticise, to challenge, to question, uh, and not just to impose, to have discipline imposed. So there's a contradiction in there, isn't there? Well, I mean, I, I suppose I'm tempted to say that education in Britain hasn't been about that for many years, if ever it was. So, <laughs> I mean, you know, the idea of that. And you just have to look at the curriculum. And actually on that point, you know, the the, the British military's also tried very hard as part of this uh, document, actually one of the policy initiatives to get its own militarised curriculum in place. The Navy, Royal Navy, um, had a very uh, fairly detailed curriculum they wanted. And I think it was taught in some schools which completely elided the, its role in the slave trade, for example, but it only started in 1807 when the Royal Navy saved the world from, you know, and stopped slavery, et cetera. So I think it's very interesting how, you know, again, this takes us back to the question of youth and young people and how the armed forces are very keen to get the education um, or socialisation or indoctrination in at a very early uh, age, as I said earlier. Yeah, so perhaps uh, that can be seen as, I suppose, one example of how perhaps militarism, um, you know, has influenced our wider culture. And can you, are there any other examples you would give about this happening in British society? And and do you think this is something which is actually increasingly happening? You know, are we seeing a, a you know, gaining influence of this kind of militarism? I mean, there are numerous examples, I suppose. But one of the things I mentioned earlier, and it has been written about by a colleague of mine, is is the poppy. And then the poppy is yeah. obviously deeply symbolic, but the politics of the poppy have shifted from, um, you know, wearing a poppy to show that you, you know, you are aware of, well, you know, the November 11th awareness of the fallen in the in the world wars, etc., to something where, you know, as a as a celebrity or as somebody on TV, you can't not wear a poppy. Um, and I, you did mention Jeremy Corbyn earlier, and he was criticised for not wearing a poppy that was big enough. <laughs> you can see how this this symbol of the poppy has been kind of weaponized, you know, to to suggest that people are not patriotic, right? Of course, that was a line for Corbyn, you know, he's not patriotic and because he's not wearing a big enough poppy. Um, but the poppy, I think, is a great or very powerful indicator of of that culture, where there's been, you know, that remembrance through to almost like a, um, you know, it's mandatory. You you have to be patriotic, or you have to be seen wearing a poppy. Therefore, you are you know, by implication, a patriotic person. Um, and it leaves people with little choice. In fact, I was watching Have I Got News For You, which I'm sure you watch, recently a repeat, and they all had poppies on, and it felt like quite a, not the right place, but they were very small mm. poppies. So, I mean, these things are very subtle, but they do mm. kind of populate our, you know, media landscape. And um, mm. when you start to focus on them, you can see, you know, what the politic, how the politics play out in that way. Yeah, but, um, I suppose perhaps to what extent is like Remembrance Day even about remembering anymore? Like remembering the 
all the people that were killed in various wars and like the horrific impact this had on so many people is it more about this kind of performance of mm. of nationalism perhaps um i don't know well i think there's you know in a we're aware of the kind of populist nature of the current government and its na- nationalistic populist kind of um character and i think you know and this goes back and you know even keir starmer's talking about patriotism all the time you know it's it's mm. become much more you know, it is one of those things that they believe will appeal ultimately, I suppose, you know, again, to a particular part of the electorate that they need. But I think it has it has become so, so much more dominant. And of course, the armed forces is such a great uh, indicator or, you know, signals that patriotism in its most pure form, if you like. So I, I think, you know, we, popular culture, again, is has become so much more nationalistic in that sense. And with Global Britain, you mentioned earlier, and, you know, the whole kind of... Um, world beating kind of rhetoric that we get about everything and of course with brexit etc cetera, etc cetera, you can go on and on but you can see how it has become much more of a, a central kind of part of well, wider culture i'm wondering in terms of the uh, issues around militarism we've been discussing you know how, how early does this stuff start as well i mean uh, we interviewed someone um, from let toys be toys about the gendering of toys mm. and mm. you know it occurred to us well what about playing with toy soldiers, um, the comics yeah. that young people, young men in particular, read, mm. video video stuff, video war mm. games? Are these yet another way that military culture is embedded from a from an early age? And is that a significant concern? Well, uh, yes. And I think there is, again, there's, you know, people have written about this, as you're probably aware, you know, and um, within the kind of academy. And uh, I mean, I grew up reading Warlord, comic and victor comic and you know very very much part of you know my experience of being a young boy were, were these comics and what they stood for um and action men of course another you know kind of um mm. iconic kind of toy speaking to those kinds of themes i mean i think what's happened now it's it's much more of a online gaming um dimension to this um i'm not i can't even think that young children are playing with toys anymore in quite the same way maybe they are i don't know but you know toy soldiers seem like a little bit of a relic somehow but possibly <laughs> not but it's obviously transformed into other militarized things if you like i mean you yeah. know for young children uh, young well for children yeah i bet you were making fx models weren't you for uh, yeah, aircraft of course, of course of course i mean you went into the raf you must have been doing that <laughs> i mean i had them all hung up in my room i remember it was Lancaster. yes so did i right yeah <laughs> It was what one did. It's what one did, and um, <laughs> entirely normal, you know. Um, and it does, and it is interesting because I used to get taken to air shows by my dad, you know. And and, and now it's so interesting because when you look back, you know, a lot of this was about promoting a, a kind of sanitised view of the armed forces. I mean, you know, um, we, it obviously it goes on today, but an air show seems like a spectacle of entertainment, but actually underneath that, there's something quite sinister in a sense if you take that particular view. Yeah. Yes. Yes, and I I remember going to the military tattoo. Yes. You know. Yeah. Where yeah. The, the army would parade up and down, and we'd all stand up and you know yeah. sing sing the national anthem and so on. Yeah. Uh, the same thing, really. Same thing. And you saw with the 2012 Olympics the use of the armed forces, you know, the military coming in mm. um, for security reasons, and also for you know during COVID they've obviously been present. Um, so any mm. cri- so I think there's there's this sense in British society where when there's a crisis. Our fallback is this extremely reliable, you know, solid institution, and it's people who will ensure that everything's going to be okay ultimately. And that's very kind of subtle, but it's it's always the they, they always end up there somewhere if things are going quite wrong. I think, or you know, we can't get enough civilians to do the job. They they, they will be there. Yeah, I, I feel like the video game example is very pertinent as well because obviously, like. Uh, so many of the most popular video games are about violence and military yeah. violence, right? And in those positions, you're actually, you're taking the perspective of a soldier often yes. doing this killing, which has seemingly yeah. very little like ramifications on anyone. Mm. Um, yeah, what effects does that have, I suppose? I mean, th- th- there is a real, really interesting contradiction. So I said earlier on that, you know, the armed forces will promote themselves as, uh, you know, generate expectations which are very different to the reality of, of life in the armed forces. But at the same time, you know, people do have access, you know, via the web, obviously, and YouTube and those kinds of things to, to you know, the act, the rea- reality of violence through helmet cams. You know, a lot of soldiers mm-hmm. wear these helmet cams. They upload recordings of them in a firefight in Afghanistan or whatever. So it's it's not enough to say, well, you know, people join the armed forces. They're naive. They don't understand. You know, they think they're getting them, themselves into something very, uh, very much different to what it is because that information is there. 
um, in a way that it never has been, of course. So we had war films, we had kind of portrayals, but not not quite, or books or whatever, but not what we have now, which is, you know, like you were saying, live footage from a drone, or, I mean, these things are problematic in themselves in terms of what it shows. But, you know, you do get a, there is a, a whole set of possibilities there about young people. Under, and that's what the armed forces will say. They'll say, well, our people are naive. You know, people coming in aren't naive. They can look at the internet and look at YouTube and, you know, they can see what, what, the reality of being a soldier is is all about so that in itself also generates and, and so i suppose ultimately might lead me back to saying well actually in a sense people are self-selecting there are some people that do perhaps are that isn't appealing to them yeah and that's interesting as well isn't it like how technology makes it a lot easier to kill yeah. large numbers of people yeah. with with little emotional kind of uh, impact yeah. on you necessarily um, yeah although actually there is there is something quite interesting about apparently um those operating drones do suffer from a kind of uh, disproportionate amount of PTSD, which is quite right. interesting because they, so for example, they might be operating at RF Waddington, which is up in Lincolnshire and the base there, operating a drone over, you know, somewhere in Pakistan, yeah. or whatever, in the tribal regions, um, and be responsible for killing people or somebody. And then they go home to their family, you know, mm. all of this happening within, you know, an hour or two. It's a very mm. strange, very, uh, almost surreal scenario to be put in, I think. And so, you know, when people are out in, on on in the field on on their missions, obviously they have a, a you know a, a supportive supporting culture around them, and the transition back into civilian life is probably much more kind of convoluted. But you know, this this juxtaposition, I think, is has caused a lot of uh, issues mm. really for people, which, which you can kind of understand really. Mm. And that acceleration of sort of technical means of, of killing that's that's going to go on into the future isn't it i mean yeah how do we how should we see the military developing over the next 10 20 years and how how should it in your view develop or perhaps it should be abolished as you were hinting at earlier i mean there is i mean, i'm not fully up to speed but there is quite a significant debate around um, you know ai artificial intelligence and its use in weapon systems and whether or not you know weapon systems should always include a human in the chain and um I think I'm right in saying the UK is one of the few countries that has not signed up. I think it's a UN treaty, which is basically pushing for this rather than having completely autonomous systems, which, you know, can be responsible for killing. Um, and again, I think it under, underscores something we haven't talked about, but it's the it's the arms trade in the UK, which, of course, mm-hmm. is very militarised, is very close to military. Um, we're one of the big biggest arms exporters, you know, in the, in the, in the world, rather. I think we're number three. Um, mm-hmm. And you know it creates a whole set of other issues, really, which are which often are very skillfully compartmentalised from the armed forces themselves. But of course, you know, the weapon systems the armed forces use are made by British companies, BAE systems, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I think this is another kind of area, really, which which gets left out and perhaps should be you know discussed. Uh, and also, we're, we're big spenders in terms of military as well, aren't we? Public expenditure, I think, share is is quite large. No, I th- I think so. I think NATO has a requirement of two percent of GDP uh, to be spent on the armed forces. But you know, I'm always a bit sceptical about what that looks like, what that means, what counts as the armed forces, etc. But we are up there for sure. I mean, the US, I think, is far ahead of everybody else, spending ten times as much as the nearest rival, which I suspect is probably China by now, um, and Russia and France, and probably us up there somewhere. So. I mean, you do only have to think about the aircraft carriers, Queen Elizabeth, the new ones, the new two, aren't there? Two, um, and the cost of them. I think they're coming out at six billion each. So, you know, and the reality of the situation is, what are they for? All they're really for, to be honest. I mean, because militarily, they're just they're, they're pretty irrelevant in the global scheme of things. But all they're really for is to demonstrate, as you said earlier, you know, the Britain uh, that the UK can punch above its weight, and they're, they're basically very symbolic things you know um and when you think about six billion pounds for something that's very symbolic it, it, it's <laughs> kind of you know it's really quite crazy in a sense but that's yeah that's where we're at i'm afraid it's a shocking world we're in isn't it really <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's, it's, but, a lot of money. Um, it's a lot of money yeah yeah anyway i think uh, we're running out of time so i i'd just like to say very many thanks to you paul for coming on the episode and talking to us and exploring some of these issues, which I, I think perhaps don't get as much airtime as they really deserve, to be honest. Thanks again for inviting me. So No, it's been fascinating, really interesting, and so many important points. So thank you. Thanks so much. So, Stephen, that was uh, 
very fascinating, wasn't it? I mean, all, all this stuff which we don't really talk about nearly enough. What did you make of it? Uh, yeah, absolutely. It was fascinating, wasn't it, talking to Paul there? One of the things which struck me was what he was saying right at the beginning of the conversation, actually, about about leadership and, you know, who we define to be a good or successful leader and what expectations we have about our leaders. And I, I do feel like, uh, and perhaps this varies from country to country, but I feel like there is that expectation around, you know, that your political leaders, you know, ultimately, if they are making decisions about the military and about war, you know, that they should be tough and strong and able to deal with these kind of like, conflict type situations in in this robust tough way and so it was interesting how he mentioned around Jeremy Corbyn I mean I vividly remember there being um, a kind of question time debate uh, where he was being uh, repeatedly asked a question by a member of the audience you know would you be prepared to press the nuclear button and he was essentially kind of saying no he wouldn't be and and therefore I think because of that was seen as being this terrible leader you know that he he wasn't prepared to you know, use nuclear weapons. Um, <laughs> but obviously, we could have a whole conversation about about nuclear weapons, I suppose, and how it. You know, what what does that say about our society? What we prioritise. You know, why is it that we we're willing to spend billions and billions of pounds on things like nuclear weapons or the kind of aircraft carriers that Paul was discussing, when we also aren't spending that much money on things like our welfare system or our healthcare system? Um, but I suppose that's a that's a side issue. Um, but yeah, perhaps perhaps that's one reason as well why we do still you know. Have perhaps value male leaders more that they are seen as conforming more to these ideas about being tough and and strong but then actually i suppose how have uh women in positions of power try to give out that image as well you know think about thatcher during the falkland wars and perhaps liz truss more recently you know she's going for the leadership position potentially of the conservative party and perhaps she's tried to give out this sense that she is a a tough leader you know there were pictures of her in a tank like there were a thatcher during the falklands conflict um so yeah i think it's just interesting how perhaps some of the ideas about militarism that paul was discussing do influence uh, mainstream politics and, and who's seen as being a, a good leader uh what do, what did you think about the conversation yeah, I was really interested about uh, what he had to say in relation to education and how these ideas of militarism are kind of have kind of crept increasingly into our into our social fabric, if you like. Mm. You know, all the sort of troops to teachers and growth in cadet mm. forces and so on. And I, I, I mentioned, you know, in the discussion that I was in a cadet force, and now I mean, looking back, and okay, full disclosure, I went to a minor public school, but the school had an armory on site. <laughs> What's that about? You know, how can it possibly be sensible for a school to have a whole load of guns in an armory? You know, I mean, I won't, uh, I won't go on about it, but that kind of says a lot to me, really. I don't, uh, incidentally, I don't know if they've still got an armory, but at the time they had one. But, but on a serious note, though, that does, I think, play to you know some of the history of cadet forces and how cadet forces, I think, they arose, you know, sort of. After, uh, around the time of the First World War, uh, after the First World War, and it was partly a fear of communism, of Bolshevism, and needing to have a sort of armed officer class, if you like. Mm. So, that, so they've got a, a long tradition, and it's just interesting to hear, you know, about initiatives like Troops to Teachers, which incidentally I don't think has really taken off. I don't think it had very many recruits in the end. Mm. But, uh, you know, all that stuff about education, very, very fascinating. The other mm. thing which um, really struck home with me was the parallels between the sort of military culture and mm. that within other uniformed services like the the police, the prison system, you know, and if you read the um, uh, famous sociologist Raywin Connell's work, she talks about collective masculinities. And actually, that's mm. that does play to this point, really. Mm. You know, uh, I mean, you and I, Stephen, and uh, Professor Nicole Westland, we recently wrote an article for the Conversation UK about how the police are a masculinized organisation. In other words, they endorse a, um, a tough, competitive, controlling masculinity and all the behaviour that goes with that. And um, you know, in very recent times, we've heard about what actually has been going on. Um, mm. You know, in Charing Cross Police Station and uh, reproduced elsewhere. I mean, all these organisations mm. are essentially they're about the maintenance of order, the exercise of state power, unwavering group loyalty, and a key feature is that women are often marginalised, sexually harassed, or, or abused. So, you know, there's there's something really um, very difficult and and uh, I would say risky, dangerous about. The, the cultures and subcultures in, in some of these um, services. 
Mm. Yeah, and I suppose that that kind of shows as well, perhaps are some of these institutions also about reproducing a, a kind of patriarchal power, I suppose. Um, but yeah. also what you're saying there makes me think as well about what, what Paul was saying about the, in, the influence of like militarism in our society and how that in turn influences some of these other institutions, that how the police have become perhaps increasingly militarized in some ways. If we look at their uniforms, they're increasingly like mili military-esque and the kind of gadgets and and you know weapons that they they use yeah. as well um, in some cases. Yeah, indeed. I mean, the only other, other, other issue which uh, I think is worth mentioning, but we didn't talk about, um, I mean, I discovered recently that um, emissions from the military, military aircraft and so on are not taken into account in, in national targets and I think that's been the case since 1995 at Kyoto when when the US were were pushing this and that seems extraordinary really considering how much we know about all the hardware that's you know transiting across continents all the time um, and the extent of conflict nowadays so um, I just think that's a, an interesting issue which doesn't get uh, sufficient airtime. No absolutely and perhaps does that again point to how there are particular uh, sectors, perhaps particular institutions that we do value or prioritize more than others. And does that connect to because they are particularly masculinized, you know, indeed. But yeah, thank you very much, uh, everyone for listening. That's the end of uh, today's episode. And um, yeah, we'll look forward to speaking to you again soon. Don't forget to subscribe to Now and Men wherever you get your podcasts, if you haven't already, uh, and share us with your friends. And get in touch with us at nowamen at gmail.com if you've got any questions or feedback. But for now, take care and thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.